Did you know that there are nine different tests that you can take to diagnose and personalize your treatment for SIBO? Let's get into them. Hi, my name is Dr. Ariane Messimer, and I'm a functional medicine practitioner, a doctor of physical therapy, and registered dietitian. And I am super passionate about helping you get to the root causes of your conditions, especially when it comes to SIBO. If you have been experiencing chronic bloating, gas, maybe constipation or diarrhea or other IBS symptoms, maybe even belching and acid reflux, if maybe you've been overlooked and by the medical community, so you've complained about these symptoms, these ongoing symptoms, you're not feeling great, you have fatigue, you have other chronic health conditions, and there's really no answer. Well, then these tests are going to be really valuable for you, not only to help diagnose what might be happening. So that can be one ruling things in or ruling things out. Both are very valuable, but then also guiding a proper treatment plan for you. The more information that you know, the more accurate and objective your data is, then you can really understand what are the the root causes of your condition and how to go about treating them. So let's get into the nine test. So number one is the most obvious, which is the SIBO test, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now with this test, it is a three hour breath test and it is used to look at three different gases that could be produced from the small intestine. So number one is methane, number two, hydrogen, and number three, hydrogen sulfide. So essentially you have a day's preparation in order to take the test. And when you take the test, you're ingesting something called lactulose and then you're measuring the rise in gas that's expelled through the lungs over the course of two to three hours we can do this test with the trio smart test that actually looks at all three gases where before we were only able to look at the methane and the hydrogen this test in conjunction with some of the others that I'll mention can be really valuable in understanding do you have SIBO and if you do what type of gas is it associated with and therefore that typically correlates with different symptoms and presentations Number two is looking at vinculin and CDTB antibodies. So when you have food poisoning, you are going to be four times more at risk for IBS. So what this looks at is any type of post viral infection. So we can see if the root cause of your SIBO is associated with food poisoning. Number three is a comprehensive stool test. For example, the GI map test can be really valuable in looking at a comprehensive large intestine panel where we're looking at per gram of stool. So we can see from a quantitative perspective what is happening from, for example, a pathogenic standpoint. Are there any pathogens that show up that could be attributing to SIBO and potentially perpetuating the cycle? What does the beneficial bacteria look like? What does the opportunistic bacteria look like? For example, what are the overgrowth patterns that might be occurring that are linked to systemic inflammation or even autoimmune disease? You can also look at intestinal health. So do you have enough pancreatic sufficiency to be able to break down your food. Is there fat in the stool? So we look at steatocrit. And then you can also look at the immune system of the intestine. So for example, if the secretory IgA is either really low, so it's hypoactive or really high, it could be hyperactive. You can look at antibodies to gluten. You can also look to see if the zonulin is increased, suggestive of leaky gut. So there's so many things as well as parasites and candida that you can really get a better understanding, although you're looking at the large intestine, get a better understanding of what's happening in the overall microbiome so that you can help to really unpack some of these underlying causes of the SIBO. So for example, if you do not address low pancreatic insufficiency and you're trying to treat SIBO, you unfortunately are going to keep having bacteria move downstream into the small intestine if there's any kind of mechanical breakdown and digestion. Number four is cortisol testing. So this can be really valuable to get a better understanding of what type of stress you might be under. For example, we can have increased cortisol throughout the day. So you can, if you're a person that wakes up at two or three o'clock in the morning, that is essentially an early rise of cortisol when ideally we want that to rise at around 6 a.m. Think of getting us started for the day. And we can also have abnormal peaks throughout the day. So two o'clock or even after in the late evening, we could be tired but wired, feeling like you're going to clean for the rest of the night. So we can also have low cortisol. Either way, when we see see these patterns, we can see that there's what's referred to as HPA axis dysfunction. So hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis dysfunction. This is essentially our stress pathway in our body. So we can start to get a better gauge of what's happening. How this relates to SIBO is that any type of cortisol dysregulation or dysfunction of the HPA axis 
us, it's going to suggest to us that there could be decreased digestive capability. We need to be in a parasympathetic state to be able to rest and digest properly. So when we are eating, we have to be in a parasympathetic state so that blood flow in, from the autonomic nervous system is around the digestive tract. If we are in a sympathetic state, a fight or flight, we have to think run or flight or fight. Therefore, blood flow is moving away from our digestive tract into our extremities. So cortisol testing can be really helpful to understand potentially one of the underlying causes of your SIBO. Also be able to integrate that into your treatment plan. Number five is micronutrient testing. So you can do this two different ways. You can test some individual serum levels. So this could be easily done with your primary care physician, such as vitamin D, vitamin B12, iron, but you can also do a more comprehensive panel such as micronutrient testing like spectra cell testing. This is going to analyze over 30 different vitamins and minerals to look for nutrient deficiencies. When we can identify these nutrient deficiencies, we can begin to appreciate that either there might be a digestion absorption issue or that you're not getting these nutrients in. Either way, we need these nutrients for proper biochemistry and function. So it's really helpful to identify where you are as a baseline and then be able to test this repeatedly, especially as your GI symptoms and function improves. Number six is thyroid testing. So this can be really valuable because SIBO is actually associated with thyroid disease, specifically hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism can slow our motility. It is often associated with constipation. Therefore, it can affect our migrating motor complex in our small intestine. That's that wave-like action that's helping move food and bacteria down through to the large intestine. If our motility is slowed, then that can, of course, contribute to or perpetuate SIBO. So looking at a full thyroid panel, not simply just TSH, which is what's typically tested, which is thyroid stimulated hormone, but you also want to look at your T3, your T4, if possible, even reverse T3 to see how you are actually converting. Then you also want to look at your antibodies. So thyroglobulin antibodies and TPO antibodies. All of this will give a much more complete picture of your thyroid and also to get a better understanding if there is an association in this case with your SIBO or other gut dysregulation. Number seven is hemoglobin A1C. So this is essentially your three month snapshot of your blood sugar. SIBO and type two diabetes are associated. So this can give a better understanding if your hemoglobin A1C is elevated and that's one of the first tests that you do, then you can begin to see if there's a correlation with your SIBO testing and potentially your comprehensive stool testing. SIBO can be involved in lower levels of insulin and poor glycemic control. Number eight is if you suspect that you or someone you love has a family history of autoimmune disease, celiac disease, Crohn's, colitis, then it is important to test for celiac. So in this case, you do have to be eating an equivalent of about five grams of gluten per day for these tests to be accurate. And the first line of defense is actually blood testing. The first is tissue transglutamase, IgA and IgG. The second is endomycial antibody, which is IgA. And the third is deaminated gliadinin peptide, IgA and IgG. Ruling in or out celiac disease early on in your journey can be really valuable. And last but not least is imaging. So we want to think of things like colonoscopies, especially if, for example, your fecal calprotectin was elevated that you found in a stool test. This would be suggestive of inflammatory bowel disease and would warrant a colonoscopy for further evaluation. We also want to think about things like endoscopy to see if there's any structural abnormalities, if there's any gastritis, inflammation in the stomach, potentially biopsies if needed for H. pylori infections, celiac to look a little bit further. And we also want to factor in something like obstructive sleep apnea. So there is an association with SIBO and obstructive sleep apnea. So if you have breathing issues or airway dysfunction, understanding a little bit more about that and looking at, for example, a CT of your head, looking a little bit deeper into imaging for an air proper airway evaluation can be very valuable. So how can you order these tests? Now, some of these
these tests, you can absolutely ask your primary care physician for like simple blood work, vitamin D, vitamin B, etc. But when you're looking for a little bit more in-depth testing to really get a more complete picture and plan for your treatment, working with a functional medicine practitioner, a registered dietitian who has access to extensive labs such as Rupa Health to be able to provide you with very high level testing that can help direct your treatment properly. If you want to learn more about diagnosing and treating your SIBO, please check out these other videos.